saw one of my news feeds this week that uh, Kim Kardashian and her sister Chloe were in Europe and were at an Andrea Bocelli's 30th anniversary concert. And prior to that, they had been at the wedding. I don't know whether you'd noticed this or not, but the wealthiest man in India's son got married a few days ago, uh, Anant Ambani. Ambani. And I uh, married this uh, daughter of a pharmaceutical mogul, so they're not going to hurt for money, and if they don't have money, they can always take drugs. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that wasn't supposed to come out. <laughs> the Kardashian family is interesting, and Kim Kardashian actually became a billionaire in 2021, they've exploited every part of the fashion industry and all kinds of things to make money. And currently, she's estimated to be worth $1.7 billion. She and her children apparently pray together every day, even if they're not in the same place. She has said that Christian faith has helped her through the toughest times in her life, and she wants her children, North, North Chicago, Saint, and her four-year-old, Psalm, that's the name of the four-year-old child, and the child's dad is Kanye West. Remember when he kind of came through an experience and for a while had a church and he's pastored, and then who knows what he's doing right now, because they're all over the place in how they actually live, but they profess this relationship with God and uh, indicate that she has religion guide her through life too. Now, change gears a minute. Let me tell you another story. Early 1900s, the Shikarian family were able to get away from the Holocaust that was happening in Armenia and moved to Downey, California and started a 20-acre dairy with three cows. They were very strong Pentecostal Arminians before they came to the U.S. and continue to be very strong in their faith, and God began to bless them. And from the three cows that they started with in the early 1900s, in 1943, they had 3,000 cows and had the largest dairy farm in the United States. Son, by the name of Demas Shikarian, began to feel called to do something for God with the resources he had been blessed with. And so, in 1952, he laid groundwork, and in January of 53, he incorporated the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International and began to lead this group where the small chapters of businessmen began to meet and it started in Los Angeles and just began to mushroom and grow so that by the 1980s, there were 2,646 chapters around the world. During that time, it was estimated that 700,000 men met regularly in the chapters. 1993, Demas went home to be with the Lord, but the ministry has continued. And in the new millennium, it is one of the largest businessmen networks in the world, over 85 nations with thousands of chapters globally still at work. Now, what does that have to do with Kim Kardashian? I'm glad you asked. Here's the connection. Kim's great-great-grandfather's last name was Shakarian. His first name was also Demas. He was the father of Tatos Kardashian's wife, Hamas, and was a famous Pentecostal preacher in the early 1900s in Los Angeles. And his son had a son, and the grandson was also named Demas, and that is the Demas Shakarian that started Full Gospel Businessmen. So here's the interesting thing. What is it about the Kardashians? You look at all of them. You look at Robert, the attorney that was Kim's dad. You look through the years. There's always this connection to spirituality in them. But they live these just exorbitant lifestyles and just 
out there in ways that uh, if you were raised in the narrow world I was raised in, how could they be Christians and do what they do, you know? Any of you been raised in that kind of legalism? And I'm not here to judge them today. But if you look at their world, if you listen to what is said with them, they're a mess. They all are. And yet Demas Shikarian became this profound leader who lived a godly life his whole life. They both came from the same family. Her great-great-grandfather was his grandfather. The difference is that when you look and, and you pay attention to all the news there is out there about the Kardashians, their world is total opulence, and it's always living in excess. It's always just living extravagantly and wildly. Whereas if you look at Demas Shakarian's life, it was focused on ministry and mission. So that the difference again, there's no restraint in their world. He lived a life of moderation. And this is the last of the messages in this series on navigating life. And I think it's very important to end with this note. What does it mean to have the balance of moderation in your life? What does it mean to live life where you don't live extremes, where you live a life that has balance that's led and directed by the Holy Spirit? It's a wonderful couple or three verses in Proverbs 25, and I, and I want to read them from the message because I just like how the message says it. Don't ever forget this. The message is a paraphrase. It's not a translation. So there's a little license in how they say things, and yet uh, most of the time my experience has been there's not anything that's just wildly out there that isn't biblical. So if you feel differently and you read the King James Jesus read, we won't argue. Uh, but here's what the message says. When you're given a box of candy... Don't gulp it all down. Eat too much chocolate and you'll make yourself sick. Anybody bear witness to that? I can. Many of you ever stopped at Albany's chocolate? I mean, that's just like dying and going to heaven. There's every kind of chocolate imaginable and every kind of nut has been wrapped in chocolate. Those coconut haystacks, oh my goodness, i got to find a reason to go to Chicago. Let me get back to the scripture. <laughs> when you find a friend, don't outwear your welcome. Show up at all hours, and he'll soon get fed up. You ever had that kind of a friend? And then verse 28, I love how the message says it. A person without self-control is like a house with its doors and windows knocked out. Does your life ever feel like you're in a house that all the doors and windows have been knocked out (laughs) because it's all way out of control? So how do we do this? How do we find this balance that's a healthy balance of moderation? Ephesians 5 verse 15 says this, Therefore, see that you walk carefully, living life with honor, purpose, and courage, shunning those who tolerate and enable evil, not as the unwise, but as wise, sensible, intelligent, discerning people, making the very most of your time on earth, recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity, and using it with wisdom and diligence, because the days are filled with evil." Therefore, do not be foolish and thoughtless, but understand and firmly grasp what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is wickedness, corruption, stupidity, but be filled with the Holy Spirit and constantly guided by Him. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, offering praise by singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is so important that we find balance and avoid some of the excess and extremes that are out there and learn how to practice self-control. How do we live a life 
where we are not just out of control. Have you ever noticed this? The more conveniences we get in our life, the more gadgets you have, the more smart devices you have, sometimes the bigger challenge it becomes. I literally spent about three hours on the phone this week because our router had gone awry for our internet at home. And I spent this good amount of time with this very brilliant person that I have no idea where they were, but they weren't in Fort Wayne. And from wherever they were, they were able to get into our router and rework it. And over a matter of time, with me following some instructions carefully, other than the one time I hung up on them, accidentally, we got it back up and running. And not only that, but she told me that she's sending me a new one because mine's old. And uh, that there will be instructions with how to install it. So if you hear some kind of loud, really not nice words coming somewhere this week, could be from our house when the router gets here. And I may have to get her back on the phone. Because it seems like that instead of our lives getting simpler, they're more complicated. And, and we find ourselves caught up with so many different things that can consume our time. And if you don't have anything else to do, you can always blow a day on video games. Anybody ever? Well, I won't even make you say anything about that. It's amazing when you look at where our world is. So how do we, in the midst of where there is so much at our fingertips, how do we avoid excess and extremes, and how do we practice self-control so that we begin to live what Ephesians 5 says? And I believe the key to this is coming back to this understanding that you and I live from the very life of Christ that is resident inside of you. In you is the very life of Christ. And that very life of Christ has the power of the Holy Spirit and the fruit or the evidence that the Holy Spirit is at work is listed out for us in the book of Galatians. And one of those things that is fruit of the Holy Spirit is self-control. It's a challenge in the natural. But you have the residency of the Holy Spirit in you, and we're going to talk more about this as we go this morning. How do we tap into what's available to us so that we don't live a life where we are allowing things that get us out of control? And then how can we let this life of Christ in us guard both our tongue and our actions? Have you ever said something that afterwards you're going, man, I can't believe I just said that? Have you ever had things come out of your mouth that you're going, oh my goodness? It happens. There's just times that that becomes a part of our function in life because it becomes so easy to express. So how do we guard that? And how do we let actions come? And it's so important to understand that this sense of moderation is this ability to avoid excess and practice self-control. So so how does that happen? And and I want to talk to you about what it means to establish rhythms, disciplines, and practices of moderation. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. So don't lose a minute in building on what you've been given. Complementing your basic faith with good character, spiritual understanding, alert discipline, passionate patience, reverent wonder, warm friendliness, and generous love, each dimension fitting into and developing the others. With these qualities active and growing in your lives, no grass will grow under your feet. No day will pass without its reward as you mature into your experience of our Master Jesus." 
Without these qualities, you can't see what's right before you, oblivious that your old sinful life has been wiped off the books. So friends, confirm God's invitation to you, his choice of you. Don't put it off, do it now. Do this and you'll have your life on a firm footing, the streets paved and the way wide open into the eternal kingdom of our Master and Savior, Jesus Christ. How do we live in this moderation? And I think there's several disciplines and practices that become significant to it happening. Here's the thing. If you ask Jesus into your heart, he comes in. You, you have salvation. But you can live it very limitedly or you can explore the full potential of what's available to you. If you have a smartphone, if you chose, you could strictly use it to make and receive phone calls because it would be capable of doing that. And then... If you have a smartphone, you can do text messages. And if you're smart enough to know how to do it, you can use Siri so you don't even have to type the text messages. It may come out funny sometimes, but it'll come out. And then you can do email. You can browse the internet. You can have apps that later on you're looking and saying, now what was that app and why did I put it on my phone? The potential of what you can do with what you hold in your hand with just a smartphone is amazing. This is a long ways from the brick that I had a few years ago that was my mobile phone. Remember when I got a flip phone? And then, and then remember, was it a Blackberry? Was that what it was called? And then I got saved. I got an iPhone. When I was a kid, I remember when we went from a dial phone to push-button phones. And there may be one or two people here who can remember when you were on a party line and everybody in the neighborhood could listen in on your conversations. You think about where all that's come from and the endless possibilities, and yet you can still just limit it to hello and let me call somebody. So many people have the power of God that's more powerful than this is. But they limit it to just conversations of asking God for stuff. They keep a shopping list for God. And that's kind of the extent of their spiritual life. Maybe go to church maybe occasionally read the Bible or listen to some worship music. But what do you begin to do if you really want to get serious about living the potential of who you've been called to be and being able to live this life of moderation that doesn't get you in the trouble of extremes? One of the first things is to develop a discipline and practice of prayer and fasting. Prayer is so much more than just that petitioning God for what you want. It's about relationship. Having conversation with God. Sometimes it's just being aware that He's there. I talked to you before about this practicing the presence of God. Someday when you're in Myers or Walmart, just get over on an aisle nobody's on and just stop and recognize God. Practice His presence. You got a day that's fallen apart? Instead of panicking, just stop and practice the presence of God. 
and then begin to develop prayer life. I think it's a challenge. Some of us who are somewhat short attention span people, we have trouble because, because our mind tends to wander. What I've learned is this, is that God's available to me all the time. And that I can begin to just talk to him like I'm talking to you right now. And then there's times to just be still and see if he's talking back. You know how that's going to happen? You're going to suddenly have an impression of something that you didn't just think of. It may feel like you did, and then you realize, no, I didn't think of that. That's when you're beginning to develop this discipline of prayer that's this engagement with God. And then to back that up, we need to spend consistent time in God's Word because God's Word is what gives us the wisdom and knowledge we need to live. Here's the problem. We get hung up with the Word of God because you'll get over into one of the Old Testament books where the law is all being spelled out. Have you ever done that and you're trying to read through that and you just get bogged down? Well, if you do... There's other chapters. There may be a time when that's going to be worthwhile for you. But the Word of God is practical. And there is, there is wisdom in being able to know the whole counsel of God. But find a starting place that you can handle. One of the reasons why we do every year a Bible reading plan, that's the New Testament. And over the course of the year, if you do our Bible reading plan, you'll read through most of the New Testament several times. The one book we don't really spend time in is the book of Revelation. And I have no issue with people who want to spend time in Revelation, and there's some great truth in that. But I, I've known of people who literally get so hung up trying to figure out the, the end times prophecies that they literally get so consumed with that. And I, I, I like what Jack Hayford used to say, I, I believe in pantheology. It's all going to pan out. Jesus is going to come back. And we don't have to figure out exactly how all the details are there. And there's so much richness in the Word of God. So when you start to read in the New Testament, here's where people get bogged down is chapter 1 of Matthew. Because what do you hit the very first thing in Matthew 1? You hit the genealogy of Christ. And so here's this whole, it's like you suddenly got into Ancestry.com and it's not your family. Well, it is, as it is Jesus' family. So here's what I would say to you. If you're new, skip over that part. Begin to find places. I'll tell you a great place to start if you've never read before. Read the book of John, Gospel of John. It'll help you. Read Ephesians. Read Romans. And you'll begin to understand. And, and another thing is this. We have been blessed with the ability to have so much available, again, back to this smartphone. I have the Version Bible. I love it. Because it has so many different translations and paraphrases that if I'm reading a verse and it doesn't quite make sense to me, I can read it in the Amplified and have it fully explained very close to what the original Greek or Hebrew text was. Or I can read it in the message which puts it in this pleasant little text like the one I read where the windows and doors are blown out. So it gives you opportunity to let the Word of God begin to come alive to you so that you can really understand what it says. And by the way, they have all kinds of wonderful Bible reading plans. There's a lot of resources right at your fingertips if you lo download the version. If you don't know how to download it, just reach to one of our kids and they'll show you. Works. And so it's finding God's Word because inside of God's Word is the wisdom and knowledge for everything you ever need to know how to do or what you need to know about who to be. It's all contained right there. And as you begin to grow in understanding of that, what will begin to happen is now your prayer life begins to grow because both of those disciplines are beginning to take hold in you and are beginning to change you. And then explore what it means to live a spirit-filled life and live it. I love...
what I heard Belle say about what happened to her at camp. And I believe God over and over again wants to work in us. People get so freaked out about the Holy Spirit. And we get in these enemy camps. You know, the the folks who are the official term is cessationist, who believe that it can't happen today like it happened in the Bible. And then you get into the world of crazy charismatics who believe that everything in the Bible and anything they want can happen, and they call it God. And that's why we need the Word of God. Because I'm going to tell you, there's some of the extremes that happen in the charismatic Pentecostal world that are not biblical. And there's a lot of folks missing out because they're so convinced that nothing can happen. And they're in this world of cessationism that the gifts have ceased. What would happen if you and I begin to say, Holy Spirit, I want to know you. I want to know. And then, and then do a word study of Holy Spirit every time the Holy Spirit's mentioned in the Bible. That's when you start taking Bible reading deeper. And begin to see, what does the Bible tell you about the Holy Spirit? What do you need to know about Him? This third person of the Trinity who is now there for you. If you want to know just the introduction to who He is, go read in the Gospel of John chapters 14, 15, and 16. That will begin to unpack for you what you have available right now as a resource for your life if you just plug into it. And you say, well, I'm not sure what that says. Well, here's your homework. Go home and read it about five times this week. Because if you're like me, it takes several times for things to soak in. And you're going to be amazed at what you begin to see if you just read those three chapters. If you read them five times this week what it will begin to open up to you about who the Holy Spirit is, what He'll do within your life. And then it's very important that you develop accountability relationship with mentors. People who've walked with God for a while. People who have a healthy view of God. There's a lot of people that would say, well, I just don't believe in doctrine. I don't know how to tell you this, but if you say, I don't believe in doctrine, you're, you're just lying because that is your doctrine. That's your operating system that you're operating from. We need to know what is sound, what is biblical, what is true. What can we believe? And that's where the Bible comes back in. But then that's where it's also helpful to have people who've walked and serve God for a while who are in our lives that we can turn to and they can give us wisdom. They can help us navigate. What is it that you're facing right now you're not sure about, but you need somebody to help you understand, how do I do this? What's the best plan? How do I live it out? And so you begin to develop those relationships and you begin to hold yourself accountable to them. I don't know about you, but I don't like accountability. I like to do what I want to, but I need accountability. There's things that I need for someone to ask me, are you doing? How's this going in your life? What are you doing about it? I'll never forget, and you've heard me say this before if you've been here any length of time, when Jim Scott, who used to be the head of Four Square Missions, said to me, Bill, tell me who are the young adults that you are mentoring. And it made me begin to realize it wasn't enough to be the pastor of the church and make sure we had ministry for young adults. I needed to have personal relationship. I can't wait to see Jim somewhere down the line at some meeting. Because I'm going to stop him and I say, Jim, let me give you the list of those young adults in my life because they're there now. Because he held me accountable. What happens when we begin to let that take place? And then that base we establish, this prayer fasting, getting to know God's Word and beginning to absorb it, having those accountable relationships, and then beginning to develop and maintain healthy rhythms, disciplines, and practices in all of those areas of our life, guess what's going to begin to happen? You're going to begin to live in moderation. Because you're going to begin to know, this is what I need to do. This is how I need to live. 
And then, where do you find a place, an assignment for service? And what are you doing to pursue whatever God's call is on your life? Well, you know, pastor, I know you're a pastor, so you're called, but, but I just have never felt the call of God. Well, I don't know how to tell you this, but if you don't already know this, here's the call of God on your life. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. You are my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Let me put it even easier for you. Let me give you the amplified, amplified version. Go into your neighborhood. Go in all of Fort Wayne area. Go through Allen County. Go through the state of Indiana, the United States, and to the world. That's your call. If you're a believer in Jesus, that's your call. So here's the question. What are you doing about it? What are you doing to reach the people that are in your neighborhood at work? I don't know what to do. Well, remember prayer and fasting? Ask God what to do. Begin to trust that the Holy Spirit's going to lead you. And here's what's going to happen. If you begin to do that, you know what's going to happen? Someday you're going to be with somebody and you're going to be at work or you're going to be somewhere in the store and they're going to say something to you about, so, so what do you do on Sundays? Well, there's your open door. I go to church. And it's just a wonderful family in my life. What do you do? You know what you just did? You witnessed without trying because all you did was answer their question. The Holy Spirit goes before you and begins to open the way. He begins to prepare the way for you. That's what happens when we begin to look that and we begin to find places and assignments for service. Well, I just don't know. This is a classic. If you've been a pastor, you've led in any area in church. This is a classic answer to the question of would you help us and fill in the blank? I need to pray about that. Well, I've already prayed for you. And God is calling you to go help down in kids' ministry in the neighborhood at least once a month, one Sunday a month, if you're not doing anything. It'll change your life. I'll never forget when church in Florida, and it was a big church, we had a lot of people. We were having revival meetings during the week and we couldn't staff the nursery. And so I went and helped myself. I gained a whole new respect for taking care of children. And I suddenly wanted us to take care of our children's workers. It's a whole different world, but it was a gratifying experience. You don't know what may be in just simple things. We've got some wonderful folks who help us with the building, who help us with the yard. People who go to prayer works every month and pray. People who serve in various ministries in the community. There's just so many different ways that we can begin to serve in the body of Christ. And there's just something that begins to happen when we do that. And when we begin, and then sometimes that generalized call of going into all the world suddenly becomes specific. Now you begin to know, here's what God wants me to do. And you begin to feel this desire to do things. And it may be that now God's asking you to serve in a way you didn't even think you were capable of before. And you begin to do that. And if you're not sure and you think there's an area you're supposed to serve in, ask. And then be okay if it's not the area. If you, if you really have thought, man, maybe I ought to be on the worship team. Then, you know, just... Get a hold of Abby or Joe or John or somebody in the leadership and say, I, I don't know whether I'm supposed to sing or not. And they'll give you an opportunity to come in. And then don't be hurt if they say, absolutely, you are needed to sing. Your assignment is in the shower. Because then that means there's going to be other places to do other things. But you may get surprised because they may say, where have you been? We need you.
It's how God begins to open the doors up when we begin to open to him and then begin to identify people that you are further down the road than they are and you're going to be mentoring to them and you're going to be building relationship with them. Live relationally with God, with family, with the body of Christ, and with the world. And when you begin to do that and you begin to develop those practices, those rhythms, those disciplines, guess what's going to emerge out of that? A life of moderation. You're going to live in the center of where God's will is. We talk about living in the center of God's will. And that's where it isn't crazy extremes. I always get amused at people who are chasing either revival or prophetic words. And usually they live pathetic lives. Because instead of just living where they are and letting God work in them, they're trying to get something profound. And basically, I'm going to tell you right now, revival is not about goosebumps. And prophetic words is not Christian fortune telling. It's a way of confirming what God's already been stirring inside of you. Prophetic words are very real, but if you're looking to them to guide your life, it means that you're lazy and not doing your prayer life. Where are you growing in God before you want somebody else to just hand it to you? It's very quiet in the house. So how do we then, how does this begin to live out? How do we trust to receive the benefits of moderation? I I think the story of what the Christian life is supposed to be is very familiar to you. I want to read it from the Passion Translation, Psalm 23. Yahweh is my best friend and my shepherd. I always have more than enough. He offers a resting place for me in his luxurious love. His Tracks take me to an oasis of peace near the quiet brook of bliss. That's where he restores and revives my life. He opens before me the right path and leads me along in his footsteps of righteousness so that I can bring honor to his name. Even when your path takes me through the valley of deepest darkness, fear will never conquer me for you are already have. Your authority is my strength and my peace. The comfort of your love takes away my fear. I'll never be lonely for you're near. You become my delicious feast even when my enemies dare to fight. You anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. You give me all I can drink of you until my cup overflows. So why should I fear the future? Only goodness and tender love pursue me all the days of my life. Then after my life is through, I'll return to your glorious presence to be forever with you. The trust factor is the beginning and the end of relationship with God. Are you trusting God? What are you struggling with right now? Do you realize if you're struggling, what that's exposing is that's a place that you haven't learned how to trust? How do you begin to trust God with everything? Do you really know God is your shepherd? If he's your shepherd, he's going to lead you to peace, contentment, and rest. And when you begin to feed in his pastures, it means you're going to grow spiritually. And the pursuit of his wholeness brings you health, spirit, soul, and body. And then I love how David ends that psalm. His goodness and mercy are pursuing me all the days of my life. Do you understand God's goodness and mercy are chasing you? I think it's fitting today that in this theme of how do we live in moderation, that we receive communion together. And I'm going to ask those who are going to serve to begin to prepare to serve you. And uh, you don't have to be a member of LifeBridge. If you're a part of the body of Christ, we would invite you to receive communion with us this morning. What I would ask is that you hold the elements until everyone's been served, and then we'll receive the elements together. But how are you allowing the goodness and mercy of God to work in you? This whole series on 
navigating life. Have we've talked about different aspects and tools for navigating life. And I, and I would encourage you, if there's any area you're still wondering about, how do I do this moderation? Go back and, and watch the videos from previous weeks because they all spell out a part of what it is to live this life with God that will produce the life of moderation so that your house doesn't have the windows and doors blown out. How do you navigate life that transcends the natural world with the supernatural world? How do you live that out? You can go ahead and begin serving uh, in, at any time. And how do we allow the ultimate power that is the power of the cross and the resurrection power that is inside of us, how do we let it begin to take hold and live in us? I started out this morning talking to you about two different individuals from the same family tree. Both came from the same very solid spiritual foundation. And yet, the one, Kim Kardashian, lives this reckless life that somewhere wants God in it, but it never seems to quite gel or become what it should be. She, she's hungry for it. She, she even named her youngest child Psalm. Because there's this fascination with God. But then you look at the cousin who God blessed in business, but instead of him just taking it for himself, he had this passion to see ministry be raised up and raised up the whole ministry and led it for years until he was 90 years old before gospel businessmen. What's the difference? The difference is he learned to not just memorize Psalm 23. He learned to live it. He learned to put these disciplines and practices into his life. To let the Holy Spirit guide him so that he could experience the fullness of God. Don't get hung up on the things people get hung up. If you're worried about speaking in tongues, stop it. Pursue the Holy Spirit. Tongues is a manifestation. It is not the Holy Spirit. It's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I'm not seeking things. I'm seeking God. How do you find the complete? And it all comes back to this. The power of all of it is symbolized in this bread and this cup. Because the bread is a reminder to us that His body was broken for us. By His stripes, we're healed. Spirit, soul, and body. We're a new creation in Jesus. And then what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This cup represents Jesus' blood shed at Calvary. So that once and for all, sin was not just covered, it was remitted. Old Testament sacrifices covered sin. Jesus' sacrifice made it as if it never happened. You know, we sometimes make this statement, I am a sinner saved by grace. And I've had people who say that with such pride. And I don't think that's actually fully accurate. I was a sinner saved by grace. Do I ever sin? Yes. But I'm not a sinner. I'm redeemed. There's now an answer to that sin. 
so that literally, if I sin, I confess that sin, and He forgives it, He removes it as far as the east is from the west, and He remembers it no more. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. Can we take the bread? Can we drink the cup? (laughs) Welcome to tradition. But what it represents is so powerful. Because the power of sin is broken. With God's help, let's live it to the full. You're struggling with moderation? Quit struggling with it and pursue what I'm talking about. Quit trying to fix it yourself. Start engaging with the one who is the fixer. And watch how he changes you forever. God, let this be so. Let us live to the fullness of everything you've called us to be. Let us experience your goodness. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.